Hi there, this is uh, episode number eight of the Brain Power Seminar. Our intention of this program is to really help you to enhance your, your brain capacity. And uh, in this episode, we're going to look at your brain satisfaction or slavery. Are you a slave to the actions of your brain or is there satisfaction? Let's make some choices today. Now, uh, We've looked at 10 times wiser, the real mind, the muddled mind. We looked at the power crisis to the brain, the power supply to the brain. We also looked at shaping your thoughts, and we looked at good cop, bad cop, really focusing in on the essential fatty acids. Now, we looked at how to prevent this whole good cop, bad cop, bad cop situation, this uh, essential fatty acid, this amigo balance. And we gave a recipe that really has changed many people's lives. We gave you the recipe of linseed, sunflower seed, sesame seed, pumpkin seed in the right ratio. And if you'd use this, two to four tablespoons of this every day on your porridge or on your bread, you would really do yourself a great favor. Now, some facts of the brain that uh, we're going to recap on again, and that is, uh, well, this one is a new one. There's an estimate of 6,000 genes out of a total of 30,000 in the human that are expressed only in the brain. Now, the white matter is made up of the dendrites and the axons which create the network by which the neurons send their signals. And we're going to start looking at what happens in the brain from action point of view. Once again, if we can take you back to the 14 hits on the frontal lobe. The one we're going to look at uh, in this session is how appetite could be satisfaction or it could be slavery to your brain. So uh, enjoy with us as we, as we go into this exciting um, program. Jeremiah 30 verse 17 says, and I need you to, to follow with me on the screen. It says, for I will restore health unto thee, and I will heal thee of thy wounds, saith the Lord. This is a promise that really took me out of a position where I nearly lost my life with cancer. Only 34 years old, but the Lord promised and he said, I will restore you. I will heal you of your wounds. And I praise God for being so, so kind and gracious towards me. In spite of who I am, he's given me a second chance. And I've had this chance now for 15 years. What an amazing God we serve. Well, I've learned in this, in this couple of years, studying the subject of the brain, that there's basically two forces that control our behavior. The one is the need to avoid discomfort and pain. We do some things in life because we don't want discomfort. We don't want pain in our lives. On the other hand, another controlling force is we desire to gain happiness. We desire to gain pleasure. And so we will do certain things to really get to happiness, to really get to pleasure. And these two forces really control how we act and how we do things. Now, let's look at this pain-pleasure principle. You see, everything, every single thing you do in life, um, your work, maybe school, your business, your marriage, your health, your religion, Whatever you do are motivated by these two forces. I'm going to go for this, or I'm going to avoid it, or I'm going to be really in it. I'm going to really go for it. But it's really balanced by the response here of this pain and pleasure principle. Now, what drives your behavior is simply the programmed reaction you have towards painful or what gives you pleasure. 
I've got a certain reaction. And this is really building and dictating the building up of, of habits over a long time. Very rarely do people allow the brain to constantly override this principle. You're not going to, if you get pain, go back and do it again because it gives you pain. Very, very rarely do we do this. However, you won't repeat any action if there's not some sort of reward. So, you know, we, we, we in, in habits, and it might be negative habits, and we know it's negative, but we do it again, and we do it again, and repeat it again, because there is something good in it at the end of the day. Let's talk ab about one example, for instance. Say, for instance, you are smoking. Now, we know today that smoking is not the best thing to do. It's really killing yourself very, very slowly over many years. Why do somebody still smoke while he knows that it's not the best for him? He knows it kills him. He still does it. There must be some sort of reward why he is doing this. Now, in this session, we would like to, to form the anatomy of a habit. Let's create the anatomy of a habit. And we're going to try and build a picture so that you would understand this better. Um, before we get to the picture, I need to remind you that every habit, good or bad, begins with a stimuli. There's always a stimuli that leads to a response. This stimuli is rich, uh, reaches the brain via our, our eyesight, our hearing, our taste, our feeling, all our five senses are involved. It may also originate in our body via our hormonal secretion. So, you know, the senses plus the hormones would start this process of thinking. That's the stimuli. And that would lead to a response. The response is what I would feel after I've done an action. Now, let's picture this with a little picture. And they say a picture is worth a thousand words. Our thoughts are stimulated, are started by the senses or the hormones, we said. And uh, so what we see and hear and taste and smell, that would start it. But then God has created us with certain filters to filter this through before it really goes to an action. There's principles in place that would allow us not to do something because the prim principle would say, no, that's not the best for you. Or feelings would dictate you. Or feelings would, would, um, would energize you to do something uh, in the brain. Now, very interesting, our outer cortex function in the brain, that's really where our principle is seated. And uh, feelings are based in the limbic system. So there's always this balance that needs to be kept between what happens in the cognitive brain, the frontal lobe, and in the limbic system where the emotions is. And we need to, to remember, looking back at what we've done in the past, it's really important that our frontal lobe, that's where the principle is based, would be in control rather than the feelings. Now, that would lead to an action. I would filter it, and it's not something I cognitively think about, Although a principle is a cognitive decision that I've made. That would lead to an action. And then after that action, there would be a response. There would be a response. The response would be okay, or the response might be not okay. This response is really what determines if this is a good or a bad habit. Now, if it is good... With me, whatever I've done, I feel good about myself and I feel good about others. I, I'm not ashamed of what I've done. Others are not going to think bad of me. And it is okay with God. It's normally a thumbs up, a good habit. But on the other hand, if I don't feel too good about myself after this action, this feeling, this response I have, there might be a feeling of frustration or you might feel guilty. 
then it's 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 not okay. It's it's a bad habit. Um, I'm not feeling okay with others in this action, or I'm not feeling okay with God. It sums down that would most likely be a bad habit. We need to know that habits really form my character. And what we don't always realize is that's the only thing I can take to heaven. I cannot take my car. I cannot take my wife. I cannot take my children. I cannot take my money. If I had, I, don't, I cannot take nothing else with me but my character. Every day, you and I are building character by what we do and how we react. I've got some good news for you. While we have this cycle of habits, you know, it starts with a thought, it goes through these filters, and it leads to an action, and then we've got this feeling, that's what's called the habit, and sometimes it's a bad cycle, a bad habit cycle. There's good news. We can always change this by God's grace. We can always change this. Science now teaches us that if we could break into the cycle 23 consecutive times, we would really be able, and we put something else in its place, we would have something else to be dominant. We would not go on with that habit cycle as we have done in the past. Please, let's remember that the principle is a cognitive action. And that the feelings, that filter, is uh, emotional. The one is found in the limbic system and the other one is found in the frontal lobe. This is why we've been, you know, recapping this all the time, saying, wow, it's so important to look after our frontal lobes so that it would operate better. Now, good or bad habits. Let's look at this, this principle of good or bad habits. Remember, a good habit, if it's when it's good, thumbs up for yourself, others, and God, bad habit, down, thumbs down for oneself or others or God. Um, if I have a feeling of guilt or frustration or I have discomfort, that means it is a bad habit, not good at all, and we should not uh, continue with that habit. We should basically change that habit. Any habit often starts initially as a good habit. And then it slowly degenerate, uh, uh, degenerates into a bad habit. Wrong usually slowly sneaks up on us and we don't even see it. Let me give you an example. Many years back, when I struggled with the cancer, my medical aid, our medical aid ran out. And a group of friends... They went cycling, and they cycled the Argus in Cape Town, and they got sponsorships, and this paid for some of my medical bills. And I really, I really did appreciate that. I, I, you know, and I wondered, how can I repay this? There was no way. But God really, you know, worked in my heart and challenged me that I would do something similar. And so for many years later, I would go and cycle the Argus on sponsorship and really make some money to to you know to make to to certain projects and it was so such a rewarding thing however i saw this in our group others came cycling with me i did this for the fun but these guys would cycle every day and then on weekends they would cycle 100 120 kilometers every day that takes a lot of time it really took over their lives. Good habit of exercise. I'm not saying it's bad, but at the end of the day, it took over their lives. Now it was just cycling. And you know, their wives came to me and said, you know, you need to speak to my husband. You know, it's so much rent now for a new bicycle. Now he needs this, now he needs that. You know, you're the one that started it. Guys, a good habit really can sneak up on us and become a bad habit. We need to change that. Now, any habit, good or bad, repeated 23 times usually becomes a dominant habit. So if I can break into that and do something else in its place 23 consecutive times, I can rebuild a white patch. The neurotransmitter connections that there is in my brain, I can rebuild that 
by building a new pathway. This means that in order to make a habit, you need to make conscious choices 23 times before the new habit becomes the dominant one. Now, God has given you the gift of choice. You and I have got choices. I can choose to serve Him as my Creator God, or I can choose to ignore Him. I've got that choice. I can choose to fly, or I can choose to scratch. That is the decision we have to make, and you have to make it. I have to make it. Let's look at this issue of satisfaction or slavery. Now, satisfaction or slavery um, really is understood when we start understanding stimulation. You see, if I have, and let's imagine this, I have a bucket, yeah? And this bucket needs to be full of energy for me to get through this day's issues and this day's work. What happens the day when I only have a half a bucket of energy? I've still got the full day's things to do, but I only got a half a day bucket. What do we do? Do we say, okay, let's make less activity so that I can have enough energy to do this job that I have to do? No, that's not what we do. Normally what we would do is, I would now start stimulating. I would get something, add something that would give me more boost to get to the to the end of this day with the same success that I planned in the beginning. And we call this stimulation. You get through that day by stimulating. So you stimulate by something so that you would get through the day. Now, the reality is we live in an addictive society. There's addictions all over the place. Our society largely is largely addictive driven. And these addictions could either be addiction to substance or it could be addiction to processes. Now, let's dissect this a little bit. The most common ones are tobacco. Many people, they know it's a bad habit. They want to change it. Um, it's not good for them. But they are addicted to tobacco. Others addicted to alcohol. Many people are addicted to narcotics. And there's some people addicted to opiates. And there's some that's addicted to tranquilizers. Those are really, you know, uh, the most common ones that we get addicted to. But there's some stimulants that are proven stimulants that we are addicted to as well. And we sometimes don't put it in the so same category as being, you know, addicted to something. But they are a stimulant. Now, one of them is caffeine. We've looked at caffeine before in the, in the episodes before. But I need to say that coffee, tea, chocolate, all of those things that would have caffeine in is a proven stimulant. It would stimulate me to, 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 to carry on, to do something. To, it changes feelings. It, it, it does have an effect. Refined sugar has the same effect. We also find that that uh, refined salt does the same thing. In the previous sessions, we showed you what sugar does. It shoots up the blood sugar level, and then it crashes down. Well, refined sugar salt does the same thing. Caffeine does the same thing. The drugs that we, that we shared with you on the screen, it does the same thing. It shoots up, it comes down, it crashes down. Well, unfortunately, red meat does the same thing. It contains phosphoric and sulfuric acids that stimulate the adrenal glands. And so some people say to me, you know what, I know it's not the best for me, but, you know, I can't, I can't live without it. I'll die with, without it. And you know what, the system is really stimulated so, uh, so intensely over a time that the person thinks they cannot live with it, and I do believe them. It does feel that way. If my adrenal system was stimulated all the time, over a long period of time, it's really hard to, to just think that I would get past it. And that is reality. Now, let's look at this addiction and stimulation more um, in detail. The repeated rise in blood sugar levels causing a process of stimulation in the body, um, that is something that I start getting used to. And really, South Africa runs on the stimulation thing. 
every two to four hours, the average South African is consuming at least one of the above in order to get through the next two to four hours. They would have a cup of coffee. They would have a piece of chocolate. Um, they would have something to just boost them, to stimulate them a little bit to, to get through the day. Now, this process of stimulation is something that we don't always um, recognize. Uh, and if you don't believe this, I want you to test it. I want you to go tomorrow without whatever stimulates you. If it's caffeine, then refrain from using caffeine for tomorrow. And I promise you there's going to be some reaction. You see, um, what's going to happen if I leave caffeine or even nicotine uh, out of my diet or my lifestyle? I'm going to feel irritable. I might feel depressed. I might feel very frustrated. Um, this is some of the responses that you're going to have because you don't have that stimulant that really uh, keeps you going and have always been keeping you going. Now, when you stop stimulating the adrenal glands, you are reminded about the realities of your life. And many people at this time realize, health-wise, they're not doing so well. You know, they thought they're okay, but they're really not okay. They were running on stimulation. Now, we need to know and we need to highlight this. It hides the true state of your health. This is why I've made a decision. I am not part of stimulation. I don't want stimulation in my own life. And uh, we call this addiction at the end of the day. When your system just cannot go without it. You need it to go on every day. Now, only nutritional deficient bodies reaches for the quick fixes. If you don't have enough nutritional value in your, in your diet, in your lifestyle, you're going to start reaching for other things that would help you go, stimulate you to go through the day with all its demands. And uh, I need to tell you, it's better to focus on building health rather than trying to get people off the addiction. So at our lifestyle centers, we don't focus on you know, this nitty-gritty and that nitty-gritty about you know, uh, leaving the substance and all that. We change the people's lives by giving them good food, give them a good, wholesome program, exercise, and all of a sudden they don't need any of these addictive substances that they've, that they've needed in the past. Eat well first, whole grains, fruits, vegetables, and all of those other things I needed, I would not need it anymore. Then vitality comes up. And I don't feel like stimulating anymore. I need us to just go to addiction to processes as well. Uh, to summarize and end this episode. There's many people that's addicted to processes. Emotional processes. Gambling is one of them. Eating is another one. And some people just love to eat. And their life is around eating. Um, you know, there's a difference between eating to live and love to eating. And, and this is really where this addiction comes in. Some people are addicted to sex. They just need this in their lives. They cannot go without it and they, they, they really pursue this with a passion. Some people are addicted to work. You know, they, they're called workaholics. It's, it's, it's something that, that's really around us all over, we can see people that are addicted. They, they live for their work. Some are addicted to relationships. They go in the one and they go out in the other one. There's ne never a time where they get settled. Uh, some people are addicted to religion. And you might say, hey, Arnold, you're off the track now. How can you be addicted to religion? I want to remind you of this. What was the world wars about? Go back in history. What was the world wars about? People, it was about religion. If we look at the world, at the wars now in the world, it's about religion. It's about one faith fighting another faith. And, you know, we, 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 we do this, um, this canon church thing. You know, we, we bulldoze people with our thoughts and our ideas. And if you don't change the way I want you to change, then I bulldoze you 
and get you down. Then another one is shopping. And I'm not talking about to the, to the ladies only. You know, some men as well, they love shopping. They cannot go without shopping. Some is addicted to TV and sports. They, they, you know, their house can flood, but they're still watching their soapy. Unbelievable what happens when we are addicted to some of these processes. Some addicted to, to cell phones. The cell phone is part of their life. They cannot go without it. They need it. Uh, the moment it's not there, they feel half-dressed. They feel not intact. Now, if you look at that list, which one of these are predominantly pre uh, pleasure-associated processes? So look at gambling, eating, sex, work, relationship, religion, shopping. Really gives you that, that thrill, that, that, that something special, that, that nothing else can give you, that pleasure feeling. I've done this many, many times with many audiences. And we always come back to this pain-pleasure principle and we see something interesting. The two main processes of addiction is appetite and sex. Every time an audience over the last 10 years would confirm it would be appetite or it will be sex. In our next episode, we're going to look at this whole thing about sex and that intimacy around that and how that involves the brain. I want us to end with this beautiful verse in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31. Well, whatever you do, whether you eat or whether you drink, do it all for the glory of God. I want to challenge you. Whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. When you eat, when you drink, when you have these other habits, whatever it is, if you can glorify God with it, you're on the right track. May God bless you. Keep strong. Eat healthy. Watch your brain until we see at the next episode. God bless.